Hello, we are going to be talking about genomes and how they evolve. The evolution of organisms really starts with changes that occur in the genome. Here the title of the slide says, Reading the Leaves from the Tree of Life. So how do we read the leaves from the Tree of Life? We read the leaves by reading the genome sequence. Now the genome sequence has been determined for many, many organisms, and actually most of them are oh, available on the World Wide Web. Now there's been many, many comparisons of these genomes, and how we compare them is compare the genome sequences. And this allows us to determine uh, the evolutionary relatedness of these organisms and determine some other information about other biological processes. So we're going to kind of talk about that as we go through these slides. Genomics is the area of science which studies whole sets of gen uh, whole genomes, right? So this includes the genes and the genes, once they're made, their interactions with other products of the genes. Bioinformatics is basically the application of methods using a computer, uh, which allows the storage of this genomic information and also the analysis of this genomic information. There have been two approaches that kind of complemented each other in obtaining a complete DNA sequence. The initial approach kind of built on er earlier storehouse of genetic information. So um, early on, there were small fragments that were submitted to databases or that were available. However, they weren't put, to put together in a, in a complete genome sequence. But then Craig Venter, he set up a company and he sequenced his entire genome using what's called the whole genome shotgun approach. Now this kind of built on that idea of the storehouse of many fragments of DNA, and we'll see why. Now his process uh, used a cloning process and sequencing of fragments um, that were randomly cut DNA, right? So they were already they were purposely cut to create the fragments rather than just stored in the databases, um, and then this allowed the assembly of these these fragments into a contiguous sequence. Let's look at this process. Now let, this kind of looks at the process here and this looks at it very simplistically and it skips uh, the process of cloning. Now the process of cloning actually occurs but the process is not shown in this picture. So here we can see, it, you know, it represents a chromosome. Let's say this organism has one chromosome. Now that's never the case. However, this makes it a little bit more simplistic. So here we have the chromosome and it was all together at one point. And then it's cut up into fragments using, I don't know if you remember this from General Biology 1, restriction endonucleases. So remember the, those are enzymes that actually cut in spots in the genome, but they recognize certain sequences, and these are called palindromic sequences. So palindromes are sequences, in this case, DNA, uh, which read forward and reverse the same way. Okay, so the enzymes recognize these and they cut them up. Now we have fragments of DNA. Now these fragments must be cloned. Now this image is not gonna show the process of cloning, that's more of a biotechnology course, but you could probably learn about it in, I believe it's chapter 20 or 19 in your textbook. Now the clones or the fragments are cloned, right? So they're put into a vector, which is often a prokaryotic chromosome that has been modified. And this allows each of these fragments to um, be, uh, I guess, contained into a, a separate chromosome each on their own. And then each of those separate chromosomes are used to actually sequence the DNA. So then we determine the sequence. So now we have fragments of sequences, many fragments of sequences. 
Well, these sequences, uh, again, these, these cuts are random, right? So there's multiple restriction endonucleases that are used and they're random cuts in the genome. So some of these sequences are gonna overlap. So since they overlap, we can use uh, Chargaff's base pairing rules, right? And we can determine the what's called the consensus sequence. Now, computer software needs to be used in order to determine this. Now, if it was just three fragments, we could just do this by eye, but there's billions of fragments. So computer software will be needed in order to kind of analyze this data. Okay, so that's, that's the whole genome shotgun approach. Now, uh, these techniques have kind of promoted or facilitated uh, what's called the metagenomics approach. Now, metagenomics uh, is an area of science uh, which studies genomes from a group of species in a particular community or an environmental sample. So this contains many different species altogether not just a chromosome from a single species or multiple chromosomes from a single species. Now, looking at this approach, this is really the whole genome shotgun approach. Now, there's two different ways that this can be done. So we have environmental samples, right? So let's say we take an environmental sample from an ocean. Now, there's many species in there. And here we've got bacteria. Let's just say there's many species of bacteria in there, but that's sort of, there's other organisms as well. We extract the DNA, and then the DNA is fragmented into pieces, right? So remember the fragments. Now there's what's called the random approach and the targeted approach. The random approach is going to basically take these fragments and um, they're going to be very small fragments and they're gonna be inserted into the vectors. And here we can see the vectors right here. Okay, so we can see the vectors right here. And of course, sequence the DNA. Now we have fragments and then assembly. So this is the same idea as uh, before, right? So uh, this is like Craig Venter's uh, approach where all of the individual fragments are overlapped and then you can determine a consensus sequence. And here we have three different species, right? So you can see three different species. Well, there's a more targeted approach where you could obtain, rather than cutting this into very small fragments, we have much larger fragments. And in some cases it could be the whole genome. So now we clone those and then we can determine the sequence of those and we have longer fragments. And here this just shows two species. Now this DNA, right? So this kind of stops right here. We've got the DNA sequence, but we could do a whole lot of things with that DNA sequence. We can study the genes within that DNA sequence to analyze their metabolism, the type of metabolism and, and transport and all kinds of processes that occur inside the cell. We can identify whether lateral gene transfer has occurred. We can determine the evolutionary relationships, right? So we have the phylogeny right here. And then we can compare these genes from other environments, right? And then do all of this again. And of course, all of it will be um, done by computer analysis using computers because it's a whole lot of data All right so these are a couple different methods which kind of expanded upon craig venter's approach all right so today um there's a whole lot more methods that are a lot better and faster so the whole genome shotgun approach is has been approved so the newer techniques basically allow scientists to skip the cloning step. The cloning step is really the bottleneck in the process. It takes several days um, to weeks to get through the cloning process. So this uh, skipping the cloning step allows scientists to be able to sequence genomes within a day or within hours, really. 
and a lot of these cost less. So these are just some methods, right? So we have single molecule real-time sequencing, and these are some companies that um, sell instruments that, or develop the instruments that allow us to do this. Ion semiconduct, ion torrent sequencing. We have pyro sequencing, which I've done. Uh, sequencing by synthesis. So there's several different methods of sequencing by synthesis. Pyro sequencing is one of those types of methods. Sequencing by ligation. Ligation, remember, connecting pieces together. Remember DNA ligase during the process of uh, DNA uh, synthesis. Nanopore sequencing and chain termination. Chain termination is really the old, old method of of DNA sequencing. However, it's still used today with better instruments, so it is a lot quicker. These are just a sample of different ways. And this is a relatively old list, right? So within the past five years, these have been developed. There are probably even newer methods now. Now you can see here, it's DNA sequencing by synthesis at Illumina. Illumina is a company um, that I, actually a friend of mine works at. She works in uh, the Illumina in San Diego. And um, she did tell me that uh, Illumina, that company, can sequence human at least 200 human genomes in a day. So you can see how quickly and how um, fast these genomes can be sequenced now. So we can obtain this information much, much quicker. All right. So. Of course, with all of these data, we need databases. Now, there's several, many, many databases that have been established, and I've only mentioned just a few of them, just in the major ones within different countries. Now, these data are available on the internet, like I said. So this uh, availability and uh, basically having them in the database allows progress of DNA sequence analysis a lot faster Right. So and the analysis of the genomes, because it provides the information to the the uh, widespread scientific community. Now, these are just some examples. Now, I'm not sure how much data is available from the China website or the Japan website, but uh, EMBL and um, the NCBI are those that uh, you can access a lot of information. So if you actually search it on the internet, you can check it out and see what types of information they provide. In your textbook, uh, there is some information provided in, you know, as a list as to what you can do with those, the data on those websites. Um, but it's better to kind of explore it yourself. Now, uh, GenBank is really the NC, NCBI uh, database, which has the, the DNA sequences, but it also has RNA sequences as well. And um, it's been said that it doubles its data approximately every 18 months. Now, there's a lot of software that's available um, online, right? Or you can purchase software. Um, to allow just anyone to obtain the DNA sequences and or protein sequences and analyze them. So um, these these software are kind of built into the NCBI uh, website in some cases, and in some cases you can download the software or it's just web based on a whole nother web uh, site. Now you can um, match to a specific DNA sequence. You can uh, predict the protein sequence. You can look for common stretches of amino acids in a protein, which is kind of important for the function or to determine the function of an unknown protein. The NCBI website also provides 3D views of protein structures. So in some cases, data from you know, X-ray crystallographers have been uploaded into the website and you could actually see the structure of the protein. Or you could determine the predicted structure. So you could put in a protein sequence, the sequence of amino acids, and it'll predict the structure for you. Very, very cool.
Now, this kind of shows an example of this. Now, when we analyze uh, DNA sequences or even protein sequences, we align them. So this is an example of an alignment. And there is software available on the web uh, for you to be able to enter sequences obtained from the databases, and they will align them for you. So what they do is align them based on similarity. And um, so here we can see an alignment of a transducin, transducin protein uh, that is in multiple different types of organisms. Here we have nematode, and these are unknown proteins, but look, they align well with the transducin pro protein. So they must be very similar, and it, it must be a, basically a nematode isoform of that protein. Now here we can see the three-dimensional structure. So if you probably remember from general biology one, learning about the structure and how they're shown, you can see that uh, the arrows, the thick arrows represent um, uh, beta pleated sheets and then um, like twist, like coil like structures might represent um, alpha helices. Now, this here shows just one of the subunits of the transducian protein. So this protein has many, many subunits. So you can kind of see the, the overall structure of the protein. Now, in genomes, and since Craig Venter had just you know, sequenced, he actually sequenced his own genome and put it up on the internet. But um, we've discovered a lot of things about the human genome. Now, our human genome is billions of bases in size, but only a small fraction of it, exactly 1.5%, consists of exons. So remember, exons are the coding uh, sequences of proteins. And then remember the introns are the non-coding. And look, there's there's almost 20% more introns than there are exons. And remember the function of introns, right? So they get spliced out, and this allows a lot of alternative splicing. So in, in humans, we uh, can actually produce many different forms of a protein from a single gene. Now, there's a lot of regulatory sequences, too. So this allows regulation of, of gene expression. And that's 5%. And then there is some uh, unique non-coding DNA. So this is DNA that doesn't code for genes, but it's unique to individuals. And then there's repetitive DNA, right? So the majority of our genome is repetitive DNA, and there's different types of repetitive DNA. So there's large duplications, which make up 5 to 6%. There's simple sequence repetitive DNA, which is only 3%. ALU elements which is 10%. L1 sequences, so these are another type of elements. So ALU and L1 are basically trans, mostly transposable elements. So if you remember in from reading, the uh, transposable elements are going to be uh, regions of the DNA that move around. And it's suspected that these actually contribute to uh, gene expression, right? So regulation of gene expression, similar to some of the regulatory sequences. So you can see, ultimately, the human genome isn't just made up of genes. It's made up of a lot of other things, right? So the gene part is, is a very, very small fraction of the human genome. Now, let's talk a little bit more about transposable elements. Uh, this is kind of called mobile DNA because they can move around. So it was Barbara McClintock that actually discovered them. So she was conducting some breeding experiments with Indian corn. She wanted to identify uh, how these Indian corn can change color. So how do we have so many different colors of, of the corn? Now, she identified changes in the color of the kernels that actually only made sense if some of these genetic pieces moved from one part of the genome to another part of the genome, which kind of changed the genes, right? So it can affect the genes in which they insert into, right? So it's, it basically causes a mutation, a very large mutation, a large insertion mutation. Now, um, transposable elements move from one site to another in a couple different ways, and they're also present in prokaryotes, right? So it's, it's not just eukaryotes, so 
corn is a eukaryote, um, but they're also present in prokaryotes as well. Hmm. So like I said, there are two types of transposons. There are just regular transposons and retrotransposons. Regular transposons are going to move by way of DNA intermediate. And they require what's called the transposase enzyme. So the transposase enzyme allows the DNA intermediate to be moved from one location, or once it's created, to uh, be moved and inserted elsewhere. The retrotransposons move by which uh, by using an RNA intermediate. So the retro the transposon or retrotransposon is going to be converted to RNA, but then reverse transcriptase must take that RNA and then convert it to cDNA or complementary DNA, which is then inserted elsewhere. Let's look at this process. We can name them in a couple different ways, right? So using the transposase enzyme is like a copy and paste mechanism. And then reverse transcriptase or the retrotransposon will uh, create basically a uh, DNA, RNA, and then cDNA process. Now looking at this, we've got the transposon right here, which is going to be copied into DNA and then inserted in another location. So now there, there, will, there will be two transposons. The retrotransposon uh, must be basically converted to RNA. So it's going to be, RNA is going to be created and then um, a DNA strand will be copied to that RNA based on base pairing rules using reverse transcriptase. And then uh, there, there'll be another copy uh, of the DNA created, right? So now we have two copies of DNA, which will then be inserted elsewhere. So now we have two copies of the retrotransposon. Now there are other types of repetitive DNA, like I said, and when we talked about that pie chart, uh, simple sequence DNA is one of them. So about 15% of the human genome consists of duplication of very long sequences. But in contrast, there's also simple sequence DNA. Now, simple sequence DNA is basically uh, sections of the genome where you have many, many copies of short sequences, which are tandemly arranged. So they're arranged adjacent to each other. Now, uh, they're typically a series of repeating units about two to five nucleotides. And this is one of example. They're called sort tandem repeats or STRs. The repeats of STRs or the number repeats of that simple sequence, right, can vary along among sites within a genome or between individuals. They're very common in the centromeres and the telomeres where there's no gene material. And they may and they play, it's suspected that they play a more structural role in the chromosome. But they're kind of important for identifying individuals. It's the STRs that allow us to, uh, allow forensic scientists to be able to identify an individual, to do paternity testing, and identify whether an individual left a, a, a sample, right, so a, a biological sample at a crime scene. So this kind of shows an example of the variation of STRs between individuals. So here we have an STR in a, a particular STR site one, and then we have another STR in uh, site two. Now there are actually 13 STRs that are used to identify individuals, and those are the what's called the CODIS loci. CODIS is a database of uh, DNA uh, profiles from individuals who have had their, their profiles determined. And this is kept, I believe, by the FBI. So here we have this site one. Look, um, the, the sequence, the repeat is AGAT. So this individual at site one has seven repeats of AGAT in that particular location. This individual has only four. And this individual has 12. And here's another site. So this is a AGAT. A it's another simple sequence repeat of the same sequence. Now, not all of them are the same sequence. 
But here we have um, six repeats in this individual, and then we have 19 repeats in this individual for site two, and then 14 for this individual. So you can see they vary, but when you add, this, this can actually identify each of these three individuals just on these two sites, but a lot of people have the same number of repeats in a particular site. And when you have more, more STR sites that are similar, you're more related. Um, but uh, this is how paternity testing is done and actually identifying an individual. Using those 13 CODIS loci, you can identify the in individual. Uh, you can exclude individuals, right, which is what you do uh, in forensics. 99.9% uh, .9 confidence. All right, so genes and multi-gene families. So you know what a gene is, right? So most genes or many genes are actually present in only one copy of the human genome. Um, but many genes have been duplicated. And once they become duplicated, they, cre they can create multi-gene families. And multi-gene families are really collections of identical or very similar genes that arose from many duplication events. Some multi-gene families consist of identical DNA sequences, usually clustered tandemly. Again, tandemly clustered is adjacent to one another along the same chromosome. Now, um, these types of sequences are those that code for, typically those that code for uh, ribosomal RNA products. There are classic examples of multi-gene families that are not identical. There are two related families that code the globins. So there's the alpha globins and the beta globins. And these are make up hemoglobin. So if you remember the protein hemoglobin, these are the separate polypeptides of hemoglobin. So in hemoglobin, there are two alpha globins and two beta globins and actually the adult form of hemoglobin. Now there's many different types of globins which make up different uh, forms of hemoglobin that change throughout uh, your lifetime. Now they're coded by genes on different chromosomes and they're expressed at different times during development. So let's look at the globins. So here we have uh, human uh, adult hemoglobin. We have two alpha chains and two beta chains. And then we have the heme group and it's the heme group. This is the cofactor that's in there that actually binds to um, iron, which also binds to oxygen. So each hemoglobin molecule can hold on to four oxygens. Now, there are two families, right? So we have the alpha family and the beta family. The alpha family is going to be on chromosome 16, and the beta family is on chromosome 11. So then we have many different forms on chromosome 16. So these are basically the uh, different forms of alpha globins, and these are the different forms of the beta globin gene family. And you can see some of them are expressed during uh, embryonic life, fetal uh, times of your life, and then some adult. So again, they're expressed at different times during development. Now, the genes that encode the, these globin genes ultimately evolve from one common ancestor. This duplicated and then diverged more than 450 million years ago. So after the duplication events, these are different genes now in different locations on the chromosome or on different chromosomes. Now they're going to undergo changes, right? So just mutations will occur over time, which allows them to become different. Now here, let's look at this. We have the ancestral globin gene. It became duplicated. Now we have the alpha and beta form of globin. Well, then they got transposed to another chromosome, right? So now we have the alpha family, well, the alpha um, ancestor, right? That was on chromosome 16 and the beta, which was on chromosome 11 once they diverged. So then they duplicated and then duplicated further many times, 
right? So this one duplicated right here, and then here, this one duplicated, and then this one duplicated a couple different times. Here, this uh, duplicated, right? So this is, a, this is one ancestor, and then this would be the other, and then this one diverged or duplicated again, and then this one duplicated. So there are many duplications which result in these different forms of hemoglobin. And then again, over time, they just start to change, right? So we have mutations which change. And this allows different, slightly different functions. So um, the fetal hemoglobin, or one of the fetal hemoglobin, um, gamma, can, it attracts oxygen a little bit better, right? So it, it has a higher affinity for oxygen. And this has an evolutionary uh, benefit for the fetus. Right? So the fetus is in the mother, and the fetus must obtain oxygen from the mother. So the mother's hemoglobin can't hold on to that oxygen really tightly. It needs to be able to let it go. So the fetal hemoglobin is more attracted to the oxygen, so it kind of grabs onto that oxygen. So it allows for a more efficient transfer of oxygen from the mother to the fetus. So that's one of the functions of, you know, hemoglobin, right? So uh, the gamma globin has evolved to be more attracted to oxygen so that it improves the efficiency of the oxygen transfer. Now here we can see the uh, alpha and the gamma lined up, right? So we have the protein sequence or the amino acid sequences aligned based on similarity. So you can see the differences and the similarities. Now, the yellow areas, which are highlighted, are uh, the similar regions. Now, some of them may be similar in being an exact uh, uh, match to the amino acid, but some of them might be just similar in terms of, um, uh, let's see, it's similar in terms of, let's say, hydrophobicity. Okay, so we have valine and, and uh, leucine here. So they're both hydrophobic amino acids. So they serve a similar purpose. They're not particularly different in size. Now these highlighted regions represent conserved regions. So these are, these are conserved regions within the protein. Conserved regions are those regions that didn't change over time. And what is the significance of that? Well, if they didn't change over time, it must be pretty important for the function of the protein, right? So conserved regions are, are kind of important. It's interesting to, to um, identify conserved regions by using this alignment type of process because you can identify regions of a particular protein that are absolutely necessary for its function. So any mutations within those conserved regions could pose a problem with the function of the protein. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, the evolution of these genes due to duplications and then, of course, changes over time. When genes become duplicated, they can diverge so much they can develop a whole new function. And this is, this is an example right here. We have the lysozyme gene. This was duplicated, and then it evolved into a gene that encodes alpha-lactobumin. So lysozyme is an enzyme that helps protect the animals against bacterial infection. What it does is break down the cell wall of bacteria. Now, alpha-lactobumin is basically non-enzymatic, so it's not even an enzyme. It's a protein that plays a role in production of milk in mammals. So here, they arose from the same, dupli the same duplicated gene. It was a lysozyme gene, right? So alpha lactobumin, but it has a whole nother protein or a whole nother protein function. Now looking at these sequences, comparing them, there's very uh, much less conserved sequences between these. This has changed so much. However, it looks like the overall three-dimensional structure is very similar still. So we have alpha helix here, and one that kind of crosses it almost uh, perpendicular. We have that here. But here we have this beta-plated sheet in alpha lactoblumin, but it's not present in the uh, lysosome. And then we can see some changes right here as well. Right, so there's a, there's a lot of changes which resulted, and then of course these changes can cause new functions.
So there can be rearrangements of parts of genes, specifically exons. Um, and these exons can move around or they, they can be duplicated. The duplication or the repositioning of exons is called exon shuffling. And this contributes to genome evolution. Errors in my, meiotic recombination lead to mixing and matching of exons. So remember, meiotic recombination would refer to uh, crossing over. And this can happen within a gene or between two non-allelic genes or non-homologous genes. So errors in meiosis can result in an exon being duplicated on one chromosome, however, deleted on another chromosome when this, when this can occur. And this is due to unequal crossing over during that process. Let's look at an example. So we have three genes right here. We've got epidermal growth factor, and these have these um, exons right here. They're called EGF uh, exons, and they actually represent domains within the protein. So um, here we have four EGF domains, and we have the fibronectin gene, which have a multiple of what's called finger exons, the F domains, and then we have plasminogen, which is a gene uh, that has the crinkle exon or the K exon. So these are ancestral genes. Well, after uh, exon shuffling, some of these domains were duplicated in another region of the genome, which resulted in a whole new gene, the TPA gene. And this is how it exists today. The TPA gene has three different domains from these three different proteins. So we have uh, one fibronectin domain, one EGF domain, and two crinkle domains. So this is how exon shuffling or the moving of exons can create a whole new gene, really. And this has this uh, gene has basically four different domain, four domains, however, three different domains. All right, so. Let's kind of summarize. We've talked about the genome evolution, and it's kind of important to remember, and I thought I'd leave you on this note, that improvements in technology that become available that allow us to determine the DNA sequence a lot faster had revolutionized the study of evolution. We were determined, we were able to determine so much more information once we were able to sequence this DNA. Now, if you remember in General Biology 1, uh, with the introduction of, of science and technology and scientific method, well, this kind of is an example of how science and technology kind of grow with each other, right? So they kind of depend on each other. Science certainly depends on technology to find out more information. And then science also drives the uh, new innovations of technology due to demand. So it's a kind of important to remember that science and technology kind of grow with one another. All right, thank you for listening.